Good morning. Uh, it's really a great privilege to be here to talk to you today about um, uh, chemotherapy in younger patients. I do want to thank uh, Dr. Mort Coleman and Rick Furman for the kind invitation to talk to you today about, um, about this topic. These are my disclosures, uh, both for research funding and also my involvement at Data Safety Monitoring Committee. Uh, none of this money comes to me personally. Um, I give my, uh, primarily my talk is on the recent results, uh, the publication of E1912, the North American Intergroup Trial. And I give this on behalf of my colleagues, Tate Shanafelt and Victoria Wang, but also on behalf of the great ECOG team that worked to complete this trial and to generate the information. So my learning objectives for uh, this discussion are threefold. What current information it still encourages chemoimmunotherapy or CIT for upfront therapy of progressive CLL patients. Uh, uh, a large part of my talk will be on understanding the development and reviewing results of the recent North American Intergroup Phase Three trial, E1912, uh, which is novel therapy versus CIT. And then at the end, I'll briefly present a practice plan that we use at my institution uh, using this and other trial information. So when I uh, give a talk like this, uh, I, I always like to look back on the history of CLL therapy. What was the first known publication of the treatment of CLL? Well, the earliest I could find was 1925. And uh, no, I was not around then. Uh, but um, Minot and Isaacs uh, wrote uh, in, I, I think it may have been the New England Journal, 80 cases of CLL where radiation therapy was given. They did find that it shrunk lymph, uh, lymph masses but did nothing for the course of the disease. Well, we've come a long way, as, as Rick Furman has just said. So what is it about chemoimmunotherapy that still has clinical benefit? We all know and are aware there's been incremental increases in clinical benefit with CIT. It clearly can increase the likelihood of complete response and particularly enhance progression-free survivorship. You can achieve minimal residual disease negative status in these patients as well. But I think more importantly, what has emerged from three canonical reports, if you will, is a cohort of fit patients with OTP53 dysfunction and who have an IGHV mutation status. These were not small trials. The two randomized phase three trials that you see there were over uh, 400 and 817, and the non-randomized trial from MD Anderson was almost 300 patients. And I think what's, um, what's best illustrated from those trials is uh, uh, the uh, data that Kirsten Fisher recently published in, um, in, uh, in her publication that the CL8 trial, the German CL, uh, CL8 trial, had a median overall survivorship not yet reached for this cohort at six years of follow-up. So in terms of chemoimmunotherapy clinical benefit, the consensus would still be that FCR is an excellent initial approach for young, fit CLL patients, especially if they're P53 and 17P negative with the IGVH mutation status. Of course, it is mitigated by the possibility of AML or MDS, myelodysplastic syndrome, and this can increase over time. Uh, the current estimates are perhaps 4 to 5 percent, but it may be higher in some cohorts. While this is all uh, there for you to consider, some patients may still prefer this time-limited approach despite the risk of secondary hematologic malignancies. So we are obviously all aware there are a growing array of novel agents approved by the FDA, and I've listed these for you. Abrutinib headlines all of these. You can use this single-agent uh, oral drug for all patients. But there are a number of other options primarily for relapse refractory, but now some for upfront use that are listed in this slide. Now, in 2013, 2014, uh, we were all scratching our heads about what to do. What was the best way forward? Should we be using chemoimmunotherapy or novel agents? And what came out of that uh, discussion was a strategy where two trials were designed by the three largest U.S. cooperative oncology groups, ECOG, the Alliance, and SWOG. And the strategy there was to compare ibrutinib-based therapy to the current standard of care, which was chemoimmunotherapy, for both older and younger patients, and the cut point there was 70. 
We were then, uh, th these trials were then collectively opened by all groups, leading to both trials completing a rapid accrual ahead of schedule. So the development of E1912 was, of course, focused around uh, the fact that abrutinib was increasingly being used for frontline and relapse refractory, but the efficacy of abrutinib as a first-line treatment for young patients relative to the most efficacious CIT regimen was unknown. So E1912 basically assessed the efficacy and safety of continuous abrutinib dosing in combination with cycles of rituximab compared to FCR for patients under the age of 70. So this is the study design. You can see the stratification on the left. You, uh, individuals had to be previously untreated, younger than 70, good performance status, no deletion 17P by fish, which is important to keep in mind when interpreting the results of this trial. The two arms are randomized in a two-to-one fashion. So a and rituximab given in the schema you see there against the gold standard, if you will, of FCR, the six cycles of FCR. For patients who responded on the IR arm, they were allowed to continue in a at the dose you see there until disease progression. This is the intent to treat and per protocol cohorts. Uh, so the stratification is listed again for you. The, there are 529 patients who underwent the two-to-one randomization. On the IR arm, 22 were ineligible, and on the FCR arm, nine were ineligible. And the data that I'll show you is the data uh, uh, that was obtained uh, at the 34-month uh, uh, interval. So this, these are the demographics of that trial. Pretty young patients, as you can see, age 58. Uh, for the most part, there was an even distribution of age, rise to age, and fish data. However, please note that um, there was somewhat of a marked, uh, more marked increase in the IGVH unmutated for the IR arm at 75%. This is the progression-free survivorship at the three-year time point. The three-year rate was 89.4% versus 72.9%. So the IR arm had a higher progression-free survivorship. When we broke this up into unmutated and mutated status, the progression-free survivorship for the unmutated was clearly benefited by the IR arm at the three-year time point with a 90.7% versus 62.5% for the FCR arm. For the mutated cohorts, it looked like both arms were equivalent. With regard to overall survivorship, at the three-year time point, there was an advantage to the IR arm at 98.8%, as shown here. This is a forest plot, and what this is basically, if you're not used to looking at it, is the hazard ratio of one arm over the other in terms of benefit for various cohorts. And what you see here are a variety of parameters that we would all uh, typically use. You can see them there on the slide. And uh, pretty much all of these uh, were clearly favoring the abrutinib rituximab arm. So given the benefit of the PFS and the OS, we were wondering, does the FCR uh, for IR for the IR arm over FCR, we were wondering, does the FCR arm behave the same as other phase three trials? And we were fortunate to get this data from Barbara Eichhorst, who ran the CLL10 trial, which was FCR versus bendamustine rituximab. And what you see here are a table of key parameters that compare the FCR arms for E1912 against the CLL10. And uh, with the exception that the CR arm was 40 versus 30.3%, the outcome at 36 months for both arms, as you can see, for both PFS and OS was equivalent. And so we think that the FCR arm is behaving uh, pretty well, pretty much as expected. What were the causes of death in this trial? At the three-year time point, uh, there were 10 deaths in the FCR arm and there were four deaths in the IR arm. In the FCR arm, the, the four, there were four deaths related by, by the way, I would remind you there's a two-to-one randomization here. So uh, the, these, the, the incidence of death is really quite different. Uh, for the FCR arm, four of the individuals uh, unfortunately passed away from the CLL, one in the IR arm. And you see the other causes of death listed there for you. What about the grade three to five AEs? This is throughout observation. As can be expected, for the FCR arm, there was more neutropenia, anemia, thrombocytopenia and any infection. For the IR arm, a different profile of uh, SAEs, 
uh, think now per, uh, results we're becoming used to seeing, more, a little more atrial fibrillation, bleeding, hypertension, and diarrhea. How do this, the grade three to five adverse events, regardless of attribution, compare between E1912 and the Alliance trial? You're gonna hear a lot more about the Alliance trial from Jennifer Woich in a moment. But you see the comparators here, uh, in terms of median age, obviously very different. Note that there was an increased incidence of atrial fibrillation in the older patients, as well as hypertension. And the death during active treatment, plus 30 days, was 7% in the Alliance trial and 1% in the E1912 arm. So what were our conclusions with this trial? First, that a brutinib rituximab combination provides superior PFS and OS compared to FCR in younger patients. The brutinib rituximab combination seems to be well tolerated in younger patients. It raises the issue, though, of time-limited novel therapy combinations, and these are to be tested in subsequent phase three trials for CLL patients that I'm going to address, and you'll hear uh, Dr. Woyich address as well. What about the, uh, getting back to the main sort of theme of my talk, role for chemotherapy in younger patients? Perhaps not with these results, but still debatable as patient preference is obviously a factor in the choice for upfront therapy. Now I've reviewed briefly for you here four trials that have tested novel agent combinations or time-limited strategies these are trials that were reported in 2018 through 2019. There were two phase threes, the Illuminate trial and CL14. In the Illuminate trial, uh, brutinib obinutuzumab uh, was the winner in terms of enhanced PFS, even for high risk. For the CL14 trial, which uh, tested venetoclax versus chlor with uh, obinutuzumab in these combinations, venetoclax plus obinutuzumab given for uh, 12 months, showed an enhanced PFS and MRD negativity, NCRs, and the rates you see there. In the phase two trial reported by Nitin Jane from MD Anderson, which is a 12-month course, is, which was reported 12 months as a phase two, is planned for two years of therapy. Very impressive overall complete response rate with 61% MRD negativity. And finally, Kerry Rogers' report from Ohio State with a triple combination of abrutinib, obinutuzumab, and venetoclax, where uh, the treatment is planned for 12 months. There was, it's a fa the phase 1B report, again, very impressive overall responses and high CR rates. I looked at these uh, front trials as they relate to age, uh, again, given the theme of younger versus older. For the two phase 3s, I actually looked at older patients, and it appears that the median age was 71 to 72, and it appears to be relatively well tolerated. The two other trials, the phase two and the phase one, were younger, although the abrutinib and the venetoclax was um, 65 years, 30% of these were 70 years of age or older. So uh, again, these appear to be fairly well tolerated approaches. So the next phase three trials, there's the Alliance trial, which will be led by Jennifer Woich, and the ECOG trial led by Tate Chanafelt. Uh, you can see the numbers there for them. We don't have fancy names for them. We probably should. In any case, these trial designs for the two North American intergroup phase three trials are comparing doublet versus triplet therapies. This is basically a brutinib obinutuzumab IO versus uh, IO plus venetoclax. Note there is no chemotherapy or CIT in these schemes. The trials are time limited for IOV. The time limited for the ECOG trial is 18 months. The Alliance trial, as I understand it, is 12 months, and then stop if the MRD negative complete responses. Again, the cut point will be 70 years of age uh, with the ECOG trial uh, taking in the younger patients. Both trials were activated in March 2019 and are actively accruing. This is the schema for the ECOG-led trial, EA9161. You see uh, the eligibility here is very similar to E1912, have to be younger than 70, no 17P patients. Arm A is the triple uh, arm, uh, arm B, the doublet. It, this schema takes advantage of a, a debulking induction consolidation strategy. For the arm A, once they complete that, MRD value is drawn and they are observed if responding. On the arm B arm, they continue on a brutinib until progression. Primary endpoint is PFS, progression-free survivorship. And there are a number of secondary endpoints that are listed there for you on this trial. 
I promised I'd end up with uh, our practice plan now incorporating the information we have from these trials. So the, the uh, previously untreated CL patients in need of therapy, we still encourage clinical trial participation. We then look for whether or not there is TP53 disrupted, either by mutation sequencing or by FISH. If it's yes for that, a brutinib or venetoclax plus obinutuzumab are two reasonable choices. If it's no, we then look at patient characteristics. Not surprisingly, we look at whether or not there are major comorbidities plus age. If they are older or have co comorbid features, a brutinib, venetoclax plus obinutuzumab or obinutuzumab alone, we think are reasonable choices. If they're younger than 65 years and fit, then, uh, and also mutated, FCR still comes into play along with novel combinations listed there for you. If they're unmutated, then CIT disappears and abrutinib plus or minus rituximab and venetoclax plus obinutuzumab should be considered. I just want to end my talk by acknowledging, uh, particularly for E1912, the participating patients and their families, support by the NCI and CTEP, NCTCN participating sites and site investigators, pharmacyclics, and um, again, uh, my colleagues, Tate Shanafelt and Victoria Wang. I thank you very much for your attention.